All right, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about hash functions. So in the last video, we went through kind of a full example of how to create a hash table um, where we have a key of a part number with a certain pattern and that can map into a hash table um, that holds all the data for that part number. So let's talk a little bit more about these hash functions and some of the important um, considerations when writing a hash function. So again, a hash function is just a function that takes in a key, the key could be any type, and it returns an index for the array of where the data for that key is stored. So you have to think about the, the options here. So one option is that you can develop a perfect hash function. A perfect ha hash function would be a hash function that has no collisions. So every time you input a key, you get a specific index, and you can't ever get the same index from two different keys. An imperfect hash function would be a hash function where collisions can occur, meaning two different keys could map to the same index. Uh, so that's a little bit of some of the uh, I guess language around hash functions, um, the difference between what we would call perfect and imperfect. So a perfect hash function is like the one that I used in the first example that I gave you with the part numbers. Um, it's just direct hashing. Um, you take whatever pattern you have for your key and you create bins and those bins are used to uh, uniquely define an index based off of every combination of every part number. In this case, you can't use something like the remainder operator for a perfect hash function uh, because that would cause multiple things to go into the same bin. Um, you can put things in the same bin, there's all these strategies for that, but a perfect hash function would assume that you didn't have any collisions, so you know the remainder is not going to work. So we'll talk about the remainder in a second, but this is what a perfect hash function would look like. So if we put t into the hash function, uh, we would get out the number 28156. If we put t in again, we would get the same um, this the same index out every single time. And then you know no other no other key um, sent into the hash function would link back to 28156. So coffee would link to something else and toffee would link to something else. And a good hash function is also able to create um, different numbers regardless of how close the uh, values are, so or the keys are. So toffee and coffee are really close. And so if you wrote a bad ha hash function that was imperfect, um, it is very likely that you could you know hash those to the same index. Um, because they're so similar. So what is this remainder all about? So if you use the mod operator to reduce the range, um, it allows it so that you can have a smaller array. And as we saw last time, we weren't using 98% of the array, so it seems like a good idea to reduce the size of the array quite a bit. Um, but doing so is at the risk of causing collisions because the remainder is by definition taking a number and reducing it to some um, common uh, threads. So, you know, there's tons of different things that when you take them by, you know, when you take some, when you take something and you take the remainder of the remainder 10, um, there's only 10 possible things that it can come out of that, right? Um, if you take the something and do remainder 100, then there's only 100 possible um, options from that. And so um, you're by definition restricting your range to whatever you're modding by. So when you do this, uh, we get what's called an imperfect hash function, and um, that just means that you're going to have collisions, uh, and you know, in those particular cases, you have to handle the collisions. So really, your goal is to work on perfect hash functions, but then just use the mod operator to fit the array if needed to minimize the size of the array. Um, so overall, as we're kind of talking about hash functions, this is like the general strategy. Uh, you are going to want to um, create a hash table that maintains a large number of uh, drawers, basically. And you, you can kind of think of this in all different sorts of ways, um, but uh, you're always trying to balance, you know, 
the size of the drawer with the total number of drawers um, so that it's really efficient. Uh, so um, then you basically need to create a hash function that links the items to their drawer number um, and uh, that would be exactly what the hash function does. That's what the hash function is able to do. It takes the key and it gives you the location. And then um, when you need to find something, uh, a good hash table is able to give you the ability to only have to look into one of the buckets, one of the drawers. And so it's just easier because you're not having to search through your entire closet or your entire room with all your clothes in different spots, but you only have to look in one particular place um, for that. And if we can keep that small, um, you know, hash tables are really, really efficient. Keep that drawer small. So another interesting thing to think about is to think about um, an application of hash tables, which is uh, how servers store passwords. So one thing you might think of, let's say you have a bunch of usernames with passwords, you might think that um, a server uh, is able to store directly those passwords. And so if someone was hacking um, a server to try to retrieve the passwords, maybe you might imagine that those passwords are, you know, can be stolen directly from the, ser the server. Um, so actually what happens is uh, the passwords are stored via something very similar or very equivalent to a hash function. And so that way um, nowhere on any machine is the actual password itself being stored. And that's how we can have more confidence that our passwords are protected uh, when we enter them in in various devices, right? Um, and so if a hacker were to steal passwords, you know, they're stealing the hashed version of the password, which is really useless unless you have the hash function itself um, in order to um, retrieve it, but hash functions are not reversible. So you can't just take something that comes out of a hash function and necessarily get, you know, what came into it, right? Um, it's possible that it was, um, but uh, a fun the function is just one way, right? You can't like reverse it. So um, someone would just get the hashed version of the passwords instead of the passwords themselves. So uh, it kind of protects, I mean, it does protect your passwords in this way by having this sort of um, encryption or um, hashing associated with um, these different private, this different, these different pri forms of private data. Okay. So in the next video, I'm going to go over lots and lots of examples of writing hash functions. So now you have kind of a good sense of how they work. And the best way to learn how to write them is to just write a bunch. So that's what we're going to do next.